to do before I give my sermon. I should really invest in a tablet, but I, I have to still preach off my laptop. So. Um, before I begin, though, I'll, I'll share a little thing that I learned at um, Tyndale University. Um, primarily in the Bible, there's two kinds. When you read like something like a story in the Bible, there's two kinds of things going on. One is called a prescription, and the other one is called a description. So when you read something that's descriptive, you're reading something, just something that happened in the Bible. For example, Jesus' death on the cross was descriptive. It's not something that we are probably, it's not something that we are literally supposed to go do. We are not supposed to go find a cross somewhere and have ourselves nailed to it. It's just a description. It's telling you what happened. On the other hand, a prescription is something that we are charged to do. For example, many of Paul's writings include prescriptions. For example, when he says, always pray continually, or always show love to each other in the church, that's something that still today we are to do. And I want to just share that with you because what I'm preaching today is based on the life of Stephen, who was the first martyr in the church. And it contains a description of what happened in Stephen's life. And a prescription would be, we should be like Stephen. We also should go out in the Holy Spirit and evangelize, tell other people about Jesus. But there is a prescription we should not follow. This is just descriptive. When his opponents hear his sermon, they drag Stephen out of the city and they stone him to death. That's not to be prescriptive for any of you here today. If you don't like the sermon, don't drag me out. I hope this will hold. Uh... Power for ministry. 
So now let's look at the life of Stephen, one of devotion, passion, dedication, and glory. I also want to say that when I speak of Stephen here, I'm not talking about our own pastor, Stephen. <laughs> Although he also has a great life that's dedicated to God. I'm talking about a Hellenistic Jew who lived in the first century, just after the time of Christ. A Hellenistic Jew was one who had adopted a love for the Greek way of life and culture after they were conquered by Alexander the Great. But because they had adopted this great love of the Greek way of life, they were at odds with people who were not interested in that, who thought, we are Jewish. Everything we do is going to be Jewish. That's all we are. So they did not really consider the Hellenistic Jews to be Jews at all, really. Certainly not spiritually. And this group of Hellenistic Jews who had adopted the Greek way of life mostly included a great number of common people. The rich, the high priests, mostly were not interested in doing that. And if this put them at odds with the temple establishment, who saw themselves as the real Jews, and hence the real children of God. So what we will see in Stephen's story is this battle between those who consider themselves to have a handle on God, who think that they are the only ones who know what God is up to in our world, and these new kinds of Jews who are learning from Christ's apostles a new economy, a new way to live. Now we aren't told much about Stephen, but we do know that he was not an apostle. And in the early church they still had the apostles around. So it would be easy enough for Stephen to leave all the work to the apostles. To say these people are the ones who have really truly connected with Christ. All the work in the church should be up to them. And I think too often we Christians still do that today. Not that we have apostles around, but too often we think about our poor pastor sitting back there at the back of the church looking at him. And we think, oh, we're going to leave it all to our pastors to do everything. They can do the work. They can go out and evangelize. They can talk to people. They can bring people into the church. But that was not the mindset of Stephen. And it's because Stephen had left himself behind. Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit and wanted to serve God by being active in the church. So I found this story I thought it was interesting. And it concerns a football game between all the little animals of the world and the big animals. The score was 84 to 0 at halftime. In hopelessness, the little animals kicked off to begin the second half. Now I have to say, this is based on American football, so it's not a perfect view. But somehow the chimp who handed the kickoff was tackled on the 10-yard line, the worst field position on the day for the big animals. On first down, they ran the elephant through the middle, no game. On second down, they threw a zebra screen pass, no game. On third down, a deep pass to the right giraffe, and again, no game. As the defensive unit of the little animals came screaming off the field, the coach, who was a gopher, shouted over the excited roar, who made the tackle on the kickoff? And it was a centipede, centipede who responded, I did, coach. Who stopped the elephant down the middle? Again, the centipede said, I did, coach. Who knocked down those two passes? And of course, to the gopher's amazement, the centipede again said that he had. So having heard all this, the coach said, where were you during the first half? And the centipede said, oh, but I had to be back in the change room, taping up my ankles. <laughs> to which, the lesson is, of course, not to stay in the change room. Go out there and be active for God, because we all have good work to do. This morning I'm going to read you now the story of Stephen, and I'm going to be reading from three different Bibles. I think in many churches these days, there's not enough Bible. 
So you lucky people, or you blessed people, I should say, have to hear from three. I'm going to begin with the Living Bible. This is from Acts, beginning at 6, verse 8. Stephen, the man so full of faith and the Holy Spirit's power, did spectacular miracles among the people. But one day, some of the men from the Jewish cult of the freed men started an argument with him, and they were soon joined by Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria in Egypt, and the Turkish provinces of Sicilia and Ausia, Asia. But none of them were able to stand against Stephen's wisdom and spirit. So they brought in some men to lie about him, claiming they had heard Stephen curse Moses and even God. This accusation roused the crowds to fury against Stephen, and the Jewish leaders arrested him and brought him before the council. The lying witnesses testified again that Stephen was constantly speaking against the temple and against the law of Moses. That's because he was saying that you get saved through Jesus, and they believed you only got saved the Jewish way through the law. And in verse 14, they declared, We have heard him say that this fellow, Jesus of Nazareth, will destroy the temple and throw out all of Moses' laws. At this point, everyone in the council chamber saw Stephen's face become as radiant as an angel's. And then the high priest asked him, Are these accusations true? Stephen gave a lengthy reply. I timed this at home, the lengthy reply was 10 minutes. And I thought, well, that would be nice, it would cover half the sermon, but maybe I better read it. I'm reading it out of the Reader's Guide just for So, condensed, Stephen said, Brethren, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham and gave him the covenant of circumcision. And Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac of Jacob, and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, the one who had been blessed by God, sold him into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him out of all his afflictions. Then in Egypt, God did raise up Moses, and he led the people out, having performed wonders and signs in Egypt, and at the Red Sea, and in the wilderness. But our fathers refused to obey him. They thrust him aside, and they made a calf, and offered a sacrifice to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their hands. Our father had the tents of witness in the wilderness, and so it was until Solomon built the temple. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made with hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne, and earth my footstool. He actually preached when I timed it about 10 minutes. And all during this time, it seems that the people in the Sanhedrin were just listening to him. Maybe they were enjoying hearing their history repeated to them. Then Stephen goes on. You stiff-necked people. You are still uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? They killed everyone who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. So when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth against Stephen. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at his right hand, and Stephen's face was like the face of an angel. 
Behold, I see the heavens opened, he said, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together upon him. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And as they were stoning him, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And he fell asleep, and he was buried by devout men who made great lamentation over him. So there I think you can really see a difference between Stephen, who is filled with the Holy Spirit, whose only interest is in serving God and knowing him, and the others who are full of themselves, sure that they know the only connection to God, and are giving him a problem. You might also recognize a parallel between the life of Stephen and the life of Jesus himself. Jesus was also on trial for false charges. And he was also killed for something that he didn't do. Jesus was innocent, and yet they killed him. Stephen was innocent, and yet they killed him. And Stephen, I was thinking this morning, the only, maybe the only thing that Stephen didn't do was rise from the dead. But he did go on to eternal life because Christ welcomed him into heaven. Finally, I want to read from a new version of the Bible which is called The Voice. It has a commentary that says, Stephen's sermon weaves together the story of the Jews and the life of Jesus. The point of the message is that God pursues his children despite their constant failure. The crucifixion of Jesus is the greatest of all of these failures. The greatest of all of these failures. The people had constantly rebelled against God, had constantly failed him, and God's grace kept coming back to them. Now they've done the ultimate worst. They've killed the Son of God. But they don't want to think about it that way. They want to think that they're better than their ancestors. They're better than their forefathers. They would never do anything like that. And I think even today you hear some people, and really I think this is the whole idea behind you know, the great theory of evolution being preached in the schools. People want to think, that they're higher than the people who came before us. We're certainly better than our ancestors. We've evolved. We have morals now. When in fact that's not true. Everyone is born and everyone commits sin because we all have a corrupted human nature. We're no better than the people before us. If you look at our own country and if you look at America, over the past few decades, our morals have really slid. But going way back, we're no better at all. And if you're here today, and you're not a Christian, you're not saved, you're still in danger. You're still in eternal danger. The voice goes on and says, Some devout men buried Stephen and mourned his passing devout Christ with grief. So it's really just giving his burial again. So I came up with a few lessons from Stephen that I based on this worst case scenario. So the first one is how to serve your church when you're given an unglamorous job. You see, Stephen was made, he was given a role in the church. He wanted to be active, that was good. And if you look at Stephen, he was probably somebody who was fit for that. Because when you look at his story, he seems very good at preaching. He seems very good at offering, uh, offering prayer. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, which meant that he wanted to serve God. You would think they would make him a lead, real leader of the church, a pastor, or in these days it would be like an elder or a deacon or something. But he was chosen for the job of waiting on tables, of waiting at the church table when they came together, of waiting on the widows. So some people would think that this would be an unglamorous job. But it has changed over time. That's why you mostly see deacons still serving communion. Because we all gather together at this table. 
and it's usually the deacons who wait on people. But it seems that Stephen served the church faithfully and joyfully and dutifully. At least we have no report that he did otherwise. <coughs> now, Lori and I in, in this church are your deacons. So I want, you to, I want you all to know that whenever we have a church dinner or a potluck or a Christmas dinner or something, if you need a waiter, you call a Lori or I, and we will come to serve you. Especially, you should call a Lori, because he has more experience as a deacon. So he's your best man. And another thing I think that we can learn from Stephen is that even when one is selected for some kind of role in the church, it doesn't mean that that's going to be their only job, their only responsibility that they'll be doing. And I thought again of my friend Alori there, and I thought, Alori's role as a deacon doesn't really include doing the accounting work. But along with Benji, they do that. They look after the finances here. Pastor Stephen, his role as youth and worship pastor doesn't necessarily involve driving people to various places, but I understand that he does that a lot. Todd's role as pastor doesn't necessarily mean, and he did this, that he has to open his house to people to stay in during an ice storm. But he did. But he did. And this morning, I think we all know the water burst downstairs, and before I came up, Sue told me that she and Pastor Todd would probably spend the rest of the day cleaning up and doing the plumbing work. Well, that's not really part of their job, but, but apparently they will be. I don't think Todd knew that. <laughs> so the next scenario I had, how to respond when members of the synagogue of freed men begin to argue against you. And the solution is to reply with wisdom from the Holy Spirit. So again, we see this dichotomy of Stephen being filled with the Holy Spirit, having lost himself to God, having now to argue his points against people who are full of themselves and full of their own truth. One thing I can think we can learn here is that in the most difficult of situations, God can still provide us with comfort and peace, even if it brings us to the point of death, as it did in the case of Stephen. So in this particular point in time, everyone was affected by what was going on. The elders and the deacons, not the deacons, but the elders of, the, uh, of Jerusalem were all against Stephen and the early church at this time. And you would think that would be an, early, an easy time for them to give up, to say, we've had enough. We're out of here. We're going back to our old way of life. You know, if you want to talk to anyone, talk to the apostles. We're gone. But they didn't do that because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Because they knew Christ, they could stand. And the same should be true for all of us. Now, for most of us, 99.99%, we're never going to be brought, we're never going to be persecuted to the point of death. But persecution still does happen in Canada. I think it's a lot more, a lot more slight than in other places, but it does occur. Maybe someone laughs at you when you express your faith. Maybe you don't get invited to particular social events and occasions. I've even heard of some cases where families have disowned people based on their religious faith. But still, we should find joy and keep going in the Christian walk. A note on the synagogue of free men, uh, in case you're wondering who they were, they are a Greek speak they were a Greek speaking synagogue in Jerusalem involved in instigating the dispute with Stephen. They were also called the synagogue of the Libertines. I think what's most important about them is that they were Greek speaking, but they were still Jewish. So they still considered the law and Moses to be number one. They had not accepted Christ, and so they were willing to argue as Jews against Stephen. So scenario number two, 
how to respond when false charges are made against you before the Sanhedrin. And the solution is to be in God's peace. God's peace is always with us, can always be with us, no matter what. No matter who we are asked to speak before, no matter who wants to charge us with lying about God, God's peace can still be with us and in us. Why? Because the Spirit of God resides in us, and He is our peace. The Sanhedrin were the highest Jewish council in the first century. The council had 71 members and was presided over by the high priest. The Sanhedrin included both of the main Jewish parties among its membership, but they were mostly uh, not Pharisees, they were mostly Sadducees. So they were the highest of the highest people in the Jewish council. They were like the rulers over all the Jews. And Stephen, being a Hellenistic Jew, had to answer to them. But he could do that, not in his own strength, but in the strength of the Holy Spirit. It says somewhere in Scripture that whenever we are brought before an authority and have to answer for the faith that we have, we should not worry about words, because the Holy Spirit will give them to us. So whenever anyone asks you why you believe, what you believe in, the Holy Spirit will give you the right words to say. The Sanhedrin, as I mentioned before, thought that they had a handle on God. They thought that they were the ones who knew exactly how God was going to operate. But they were a bit mistaken. Oh, yes. And they thought that they, more than any others, were better to able to, under, to understand and evaluate God's truth. So, that meant that any opposition to them must therefore be blasphemy. <coughs> because they were on God's side. So rather than really listening to others to see if they had any truth to say, it had to be blasphemy. Those people had to be condemned. What this really was, in a way, was a battle over power. The Sanhedrin and the Jewish people of the time had the power, and they saw the new Christians threatening that. So they wanted to get rid of that. If they had really listened, maybe they would have been saved themselves. But they were so full of themselves, they only concerned themselves with what they had at the time. We should not be like that. We should concern ourselves with things above and help others to escape this world, to escape <coughs> thinking and living in this world, to live with God. What a contrast there must have been between the Sanhedrin and Stephen. The Sanhedrin was probably, at best, being very official, at worst being angry, gnashing their teeth, eventually, being furious. Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. He had confidence and peace. He radiated joy and courage. Those are blessings from God. And really, they come only from God. To be able to face, no matter what happens, no matter what happens in your life, with that kind of boldness can really only come from God. Anything else is just transitory. So the next scenario, how to plead when the high priest asks you if charges of blasphemy that you know are false are true. I think I want number four. <laughs> so, the, so the answer is to charge the Sanhedrin. Charge right back, charge the Sanhedrin with disobeying God as their ancestors did before them. Have the bigger picture. They wanted to only look at the immediate thing of what Stephen was doing against them. But Stephen had the bigger picture. Stephen knew his history and thus could answer back. And I think that's a message to all of us as well. We should know Christian history. We should know what has transpired in the faith. We should know our Bibles. We should study our scripture. 
so that we are able to answer anyone who might charge us, anyone who might ask us what we, what we believe and why we believe it. I mean, if you don't, your answer might just be, oh, I don't know, it seemed like a good idea to me at the time. But no, we should be able to answer theologically, we should be able to answer historically. These days, it's becoming more and more important to be able to cite facts. People are looking for scientific evidence. Actually, many people are looking for scientific evidence to prove the resurrection. There is an element of supernatural, uh, supernaturalness to God. So it cannot be you know, perfectly scientifically proven. There is an element of faith, which is something above science. But still, it's becoming more and more important to base our ideas and our beliefs on facts, certainly on the facts of the Bible. So we must know them. So with the Sanhedrin, they believed that they had always kept the law from the time of Moses. And so they were fine listening to Stephen talk for 10 minutes about how history had gone and how God had been faithful to them. And they probably believed that God had been faithful to them and would always continue. One of the chief differences, though, between Stephen and between the Sanhedrin and the other Jewish people at the time was that Stephen and the new church were interested in giving their faith away, interested in sharing their faith, interested in telling others about their faith. And in doing that, they gained strength. They gained power. The Sanhedrin were interested in keeping things the way that they were. They wanted to be the only one who had a connection with God, so that all of God's blessings would rain down on them. And eventually, they fell. They were very full of themselves. They were very puffed up, and that brought them trouble. When we look at today's church, do we see anywhere that we are currently puffed up? That we are currently all full of ourselves, and we should yield more to God's Spirit. I would say this affects a small church like Islington less, but it is certainly going on around us. Paul, the Apostle Paul, warned us not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. But in the modern church, all too often, we boast about our attendance. How many people are coming in the doors? is often a big thing. Having gone to Christian University, I've heard from so many people, how many, how many people are coming into your church? That's number, one of the number one things that I get asked at the university when just talking with people. Well, where do you go to church? So you tell me, how many people are there? What we should be primarily concerned with is telling God's truth and trusting in the Holy Spirit to bring people in. If he does, if the church expands, that's incredibly amazing. But it should never be our top priority. We also boast about our buildings, how big our building is. And for some churches, they boast about their television and their radio ratings. Just this past week, when we Doing a little research, I got interested. I remember a thing from early on, earlier on in my life. My dad used to watch a show called the PTL Club. I guess some of you remember that, the PTL Club. But one of the things I remembered about it was they used to have an amusement park called Heritage USA. And at the time that it was going, it was the number three amusement park in the world, behind Disneyland and Disney World. And for some reason, I just got interested. So I was looking it up. I never realized just how huge the place was. We have a farm down in uh, New Brunswick that's about 100 acres. But this place was about 23, 24 times that size. And I remember from the show that they were always talking about how great this place was and how it needed 
funded. And I think, yes, there probably were some things, good things that went on there. But having a place like that should never be any church's number one priority. What Stephen demonstrated was the beauty of humbleness, the beauty of emptying yourself, the beauty of giving your soul only to God. I think by the time that they, that they killed him, maybe to a very large degree there was no more Stephen. Maybe Stephen had emptied himself as his own person to direct his own life so greatly that the only thing left was to go to heaven and be with Christ. He was so much of a Christian. The next step in his life had to be to join God in glory. What a contrast. But they thought that he would come. But again, it was very interesting to me that they listened to him for 10 minutes. They didn't do anything. But then when he says, you're just like your forefathers who came before you. They attack him, they drag him out of the city, and they kill him. So, I mean, that raises the question for us. What should our evangelism be like? Should we just say how God has acted in the past? That seems very safe. We can say, oh, God has done this and done that and this. But when you charge people, when you tell people the bad news, because you do have to alert them to the bad news, you do have to say, you also are sick of sin. You also have this disease. If they're going to be cured, that's when they may revolt on us. They probably won't kill us. But they may leave us. They may not want to speak to us again. They might want to have nothing to do with us. They might spread bad rumors about us, as the free men did to Stephen. Is it worth it? Should we take that risk of losing, it could be a friend, it could be a family member. If you really are poor in spirit, and the kingdom of heaven, of heaven really belongs to you, then that is no longer a question. If God is in your life as much as he was in Stephen's, you have to do that, no matter what the consequence may be. The next scenario, how to respond when the members of the Sanhedrin furiously gnashed their teeth at you. This is what they did. And the solution again, to be full of the Holy Spirit, to look up to heaven and see the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. When I read in the Bible that the Sanhedrin were furiously gnashing their teeth excuse me, at Stephen. I thought, where else in the Bible does this take place? Where else in the text do people furiously gnash their teeth? And I believe that Jesus speaks of people in hell as gnashing their teeth. Which pretty much identifies where the Sanhedrin were coming from at that point. Because to be angry at Stephen, a man who was so filled with the Holy Spirit, was pretty much to be on the wrong side. To be angry at him was to be like angry at God. Another thing I saw that was interesting in the text, it says that Jesus, he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I thought that was interesting because usually the Bible says that Jesus ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of God. So why did Stephen see Jesus standing? Maybe it's because even Jesus himself wanted to give some kind of honor or some kind of tribute to Stephen for his act, what he did. Or maybe it was because he simply wanted to welcome the first martyr, the first person to die for the faith. Those are just in any event, Stephen had 
a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which we all do. And he knew that no matter what else was going on in the world around him, he knew to look up and focus on God, focus on Jesus, and gain his peace and his strength from there. We should do that too. No matter what else is going on in the world around us, no matter what problems seem to have come in our lives, whether that's a relationship or a financial thing, no matter what it may be, we should always look up, look to God, be at peace. Next scenario. How to respond when the members of the Sanhedrin begin to stone you to death? The solution, pray that Jesus will receive your spirit and that he will also forgive them for killing you. Wow. They were murdering him. He had done nothing wrong. And you would think that to some degree, they even understood that he had done nothing wrong and they were killing him. And in the midst of that, he prays to God that God will forgive them. That, of course, also was the prayer of Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them. In school, I studied a pastor in Korea, Pastor Song Yan Wan. He was a pastor in a church. Eventually, in his life, he was imprisoned. And the prison guards one night took them all out, all the prisoners, and shot them dead. And in the midst of this killing field, Pastor Son did the same thing. He evangelized to them and prayed that God would forgive them. I don't think that any of us are going to be killed or going to be martyred. But we're all going to face some kind of opposition in our walk with Christ. If you don't face some kind of opposition in your walk with Christ, some kind, you should really ask yourself whether or not you have a genuine relationship with Christ. If you're really out there telling people about Jesus, someone will try to stop you. And you should pray for them. Pray that God will forgive them. Pray that God will speak to their hearts. And enter in and give them peace. Finally, I had a mighty, I say the last thing you should do is die. Which I guess if they're stoning you to death, that's the last thing you do. But up there, I think I changed it. I said, rest in peace with God. Because when you're a Christian, and you die, or you're killed, and you die, you're not just dying, you're not just dead. You go to meet with God in heaven for eternity. So finally, I thought we should look at what happened after Stephen was martyred. Because the goal of the Sanhedrin, the goal of the Jewish priests at the time, was to put a stop to this whole thing uh, called Christianity. The Christians were preaching that God's kingdom was not just confined to the Jews anymore. That it was now to spread out across the whole world, eventually. In fact, Jesus himself had told the apostles, and no doubt the apostles had told their followers, that the kingdom of God was to go out from Jerusalem to the very ends of the earth. Now that sounds great for us Christians today, but, if you are a Jewish person back then, you might not like that so much. You want the Jewish people, and only the Jewish people, to remain God's people. You might want to be the only group of people who are blessed by God in that way. So that was really the battle that was going on. They tried to stop the spread of God's kingdom. But when you read what happened, it didn't work out that way. Because after Stephen was persecuted, after he was martyred, persecution rose up to 
to an increased degree in Jerusalem, to the point at which many of the Christians had to flee Jerusalem to go into Judea and Samaria. And of course, they brought their gospel message with them. The kingdom of God cannot be stopped. Nothing can stop the kingdom of God. No matter who tries, no matter what they do, it must go out. And we have the same charge on us today. We also are to take the kingdom of God to new places. There are tribes in the world that have never heard God's message. So we need to go ourselves, or we need to support missionaries, or we need to pray that other people will reach them. We need to do something, something, to save these lost people. Of course, it's the Holy Spirit who does that work, but we are called to do our part as well. And my question for you in the new year is, is there any place in your own life that doesn't know about any people who don't, who don't know about the kingdom of God? Is there any area in your own life that you're shielding away from God? How much of your own self are you keeping within yourself? Your own wants, your own desires. Is God asking you to do anything and you're refusing to do it? If you are, you're not truly being poor in spirit like Stephen was. This morning's message, I could have said very simply, read the Bible, see what Stephen does, and then do the same. And that's what I'm encouraging you all to do. After the resurrection, Jesus' apostles had asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So their thoughts were only on the kingdom being in Israel, being here in the world. Jesus said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And we are to continue in the same light. Thank you, and God bless you.